This episode is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. Hey, Wisecrack, Jared here. Hollywood's a tricky business. Audiences' tastes constantly shift over time. A genre that's popular in one moment can run out of fashion a second later. But there's one thing you can always count on. People love to be scared. That's why no matter the decade, horror films have been a constant fixture in cinema. From the universal monsters of the 30s, to the slashers of the 80s and 90s, to the so-called torture porn of the early aughts. Horror today, though, isn't necessarily categorized by masked killers or monsters. Instead, it's become mostly synonymous with one company, Blumhouse. Since 2007, Blumhouse has revitalized the genre with hit after hit, like Paranormal Activity, The Purge, Get Out, Us, and many more. Their films have pushed horror into uncharted territory, gaining both commercial and critical success. Hell, many have even labeled this current period the golden age of horror. On the surface, Blumhouse's films all appear to be different, running the gamut from ghost stories to slashers to socio-political commentaries. I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. Producer and CEO of Blumhouse, Jason Blum, even stated that he's always been very conscious of not repeating himself. He said, wearing my entrepreneur's hat, I'm very conscious of not falling into a pattern. The tenets of the company are the same, but the kinds of things that we're doing are very, very different than 10 years ago. But the secret sauce of Blumhouse's success might actually be rooted in being cheapskates. According to Blum, the only real pattern is an economic one. Unlike other studios which pour tens or hundreds of millions of dollars into a single film, Blumhouse tries to make sure each film costs no more than five million. By being so budget conscious, Blumhouse has, strangely enough, stumbled into making some of the most insightful commentaries on a basic part of American life, the home. So let's find out how in this Wisecrack edition on how Blumhouse changed horror. And spoilers ahead for Blumhouse greats like Paranormal Activity, Insidious, Sinister, Get Out, Halloween, and Us. But before we continue, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, The Ridge Wallet. The Ridge Wallet is a light, sleek, and industrial wallet designed to last you a lifetime. Each wallet is made with RFID blocking technology, which protects you from digital pickpockets. The durable metal also means each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty, so this could be the last wallet you ever buy. It's perfect if you don't want to carry around a bulky, old, lumpy leather wallet in your pocket and still want to maximize the amount of cards you carry. It holds up to 12 cards and still has room for cash. I got the titanium gunmetal wallet and nothing beats how sleek it is. The Ridge team is so confident that you will like it that if you don't and send it back within 45 days, you will receive a full refund. Grab your own Ridge wallet today by going to ridge.com slash wisecrack and use the promo code wisecrack to get 10% off. You will get free worldwide shipping and returns, so click the link in the description to get one today. And now back to the show. Since Blumhouse needs to keep their costs low, most of their films are set in a single location and shot in one of the cheapest, easiest places a filmmaker can find, a house. Money aside, most horror films focused on the opposite, showing what happens when people leave their home. Just look at some of the most popular horror films before Blumhouse arrived on the scene. In the 1960s, a young woman left home seeking safety in a creepy motel with great amenities. <laughs> In the 1970s, a group of teens went on a road trip only to face off against this beautiful family. In the 1980s, a family leaves home to become caretakers at a hotel only to be haunted by clear building code violations. In the 90s, some teen vloggers ventured into the woods in search of a witch and things didn't go much better. I'm so sorry. And in the early aughts, a bunch of horny college students went overseas only to end up, well, you can probably guess. The template in all these films is the same. A group of attractive people go on a road trip or camping or overseas and typically die in the most horrific fashion possible. The message, if only everyone could just stay home, then nothing bad would happen. In these films, homes are often depicted as safe havens, a refuge from the horrors of the outside world. In the midst of terror, characters will often remark how they wish they could be home or talk about what they're going to do when they get back to their real lives. I want to go home, please. I want to go home. And I'm just very hungry. I'm very tired. And I'm very scared and I just want to go home, okay? There are exceptions to this rule, of course, but two notable ones are the genres of the haunted house and the home invasion. 
A typical haunted house film focuses on, well, of course, a house. In these films, a group of people will either knowingly or unknowingly move into a haunted structure. The houses in these films don't represent safety and security. They are unknown spaces that we know from the start will doom yet another set of hopeless fools. And in the home invasion horror genre, an outside force, most often a killer, threatens the domestic stability of a family, stalking and then attacking them in their home. The family must then ward off their intruders, like an unwanted vermin, and re-establish the home as a beacon of safety. These films often end with the killer being literally expelled from the house, and the closing shot is frequently a wide shot of the house, the sun coming up in the distance, showing the horror is over and everything is safe once more. Thus, ultimately the point of these films is to restore the sanctity of the home. However, Blumhouse subtly began to shift how horror films depict homes, in the process redefining both the haunted house, the home invasion genre, and horror as a whole. Take their breakout hit, 2007's Paranormal Activity. Unlike the typical haunted house film which focuses on a creepy, gothic, and foreboding home, Paranormal Activity's house is, well, completely ordinary. There's nothing spooky or creepy about the way it's portrayed. In fact, the early scenes of the film go out of the way to do the opposite, painting the most idealistic portrait of the home possible. In the opening scene, Micah films around his house, capturing a shot of his girlfriend returning home, which reveals their lovely suburban neighborhood. In these early scenes, the camera lingers on furniture and decor, like we're in an episode of MTV's Cribs. And the exact same thing happens in Paranormal Activity 2. The sequel opens with the family recording everything in their house for the posterity of their newborn. Yet again, it's a Cribs episode come to life, the camera showing off the open kitchen, the white sofas, another huge ass TV, and let's not forget, a jacuzzi. Both Paranormal Activity films take the time to show just how pristine these homes are. They are the quintessential beacons of a safe, upper-middle-class life. But of course, not everything is as it seems. A demonic entity haunts both households, though the first signs of it are presented as common household disturbances. In the opening scene of Paranormal Activity, Katie thinks she hears something strange. Could it be demonic? Nah, Micah dismisses the sound as just the ice maker. Ultimately, the demonic entity escalates its attack, making itself fully known by literally destroying the house. In Paranormal Activity, the entity cracks Micah and Katie's photographs, and in Paranormal Activity 2, the entities completely destroyed the house. Furniture's damaged. My daughter Allie's room. Master bedroom. Yeah, so that's great. Even worse, there's no way to get rid of it. Not even a renowned ghost psychic can help Micah and Katie. He takes one step into the house, and then, well... In fact, I've got to get out of here. This thing is very aggravated. The home simply isn't safe anymore. I can't, I can't be here, I can't. Just let's go, please let's go. Paranormal Activity's depiction of the home somewhat coincidentally reflects the growing anxiety around housing in the lead up to the Great Recession. In 2007, the housing bubble started to burst as millions of American households with subprime loans found themselves unable to pay their mortgage. That year alone, there were over 2.3 million foreclosures. The homes people thought were their safe havens suddenly became their undoing. Per film historian James Stone, the paranormal activity films track the gradual collapse of the economic dream. The business of the demon is to lay waste to materialist splendor. Each movie takes place in a sizable, well-appointed home, and then it all comes crashing down. Stone goes on to cite Paranormal Activity 2 specifically. In the film, one of the protagonists, Allie, discovers her family's ancestors had made a bargain to become wealthy by forfeiting the soul of their firstborn son. What if Christie's great grandmother made a deal with a demon so she could get rich? However, because the deal was never fulfilled, the demon stuck to the family until another son was born. Thus, the demon attacks because their family quite simply hasn't paid their debt. As Stone writes, the demon is an agent of the recession because he claims and destroys domestic space, and like a vindictive creditor, the monster begins his campaign of terror after a deal is reneged upon. Blumhouse's later films, Insidious and Sinister, go even further, showing that it isn't just a singular home or family that is tainted, but potentially every household. Insidious opens much like Paranormal Activity, depicting a seemingly ideal home, yet the opening credits show something's wrong right from the outset. We see still photographs of a beautiful house, a family having just moved in, yet in many of the shots, pictures and chairs move on their own. Sure enough, it's not long before the family realizes they're in a haunted house. I'm scared of this house. There's something wrong with this place. I'm not imagining it. I can feel it. It's, it's 
like a sickness. Faced with the prospect of being paranormally terrorized, the family does the only sensible thing. They move. However, despite moving to a new home, nothing changes. They begin to experience the same ghostly hauntings yet again. It turns out that the family's comatose son is a beacon for the supernatural world, inviting the ghosts into the physical realm. Thus, no matter where they go, no home will ever be safe. Their house will always be haunted. The same is true in Sinister. After true crime novelist Ellison Oswald discovers his new home may be haunted by a demonic entity, he yet again does the seemingly sensible thing, getting the hell out. Yet, as it turns out, the entity haunting the house, Bagul, is a demonic parasite that travels from home to home. Mr. Oswald, you just moved out of the last house in line. If, if this guy is still out there, you not only just sped up his timeline, you put yourself in it. It's only after a family moves that Bagul is able to possess the youngest to kill the rest of the family. Thus, by moving, Ellison has inadvertently placed himself and his family in mortal danger. Both Insidious and Sinister reject the notion of a singular haunted house. In the traditional haunted house film, as long as you escape the house, you're safe. However, in both Insidious and Sinister, the haunting follows the family. Fleeing does nothing to solve the problem and in fact may spell your doom. And it's not just the home but the entire neighborhood that's no longer safe. In the early 1980s and amid public concerns around crime rates, a new form of living began to sprout up across the country, the gated community. In Ed Blakely and Mary Gail Snyder's Fortress America, they detailed how Americans were increasingly choosing to move to these supposedly safer communities. As they write, Americans of all classes are fording up, attempting to secure the value of their houses, reduce or escape from the impact of crime, and find neighbors who share their sense of the good life. In The Purge, the logic of the gated community is made extreme. It's no longer one secured neighborhood that keeps one safe from outsiders, but an individual's house turned fortress. The Sandins live in an ideal bright suburban neighborhood where everyone knows your name. It's the type of place where your neighbors even bake you homemade cookies. The Sandins have a deluxe security system that is supposedly foolproof in protecting them from the violence of the outside world. As such, the family believes they are completely safe on Purge Night. I know bad things do happen tonight. But we can afford protection, so we'll be fine just like always, no worries, okay? However, the Sandins are so focused on protecting themselves from the outside world, they fail to realize the actual threat is within their own community. It's not some other, it's their neighbors, the same that gave them the delightful treats. The gated community of the Purge isn't a safe haven from the outside world, it's the nexus from which violence originates. Similarly, Get Out inverts the idea of the safe suburbs by opening with a black man, a quote-unquote outsider, lost and scared amongst the white middle-class affluence. You got me out here in this creepy, confusing ass suburb. <laughs> Girl, so serious though. Like a sore thumb out here. And sure enough, his paranoia proves right when he's quickly abducted in the middle of all the perfectly cut grass, matching driveways, and brightly lit homes. Get Out does away with the very pretense of safety in the suburbs. Instead, the suburban home is something to escape, to get out from. When Chris arrives at his girlfriend's family home, he immediately notices something is wrong. It may seem like the typical suburban ideal, but underneath, something is amiss. Chris sees that the only black people in the house are servants and that they're acting off. Later, when there's a party at the house, he realizes that nearly everyone there is white and staring at him. It's weird, man. I just people here too. It's like they haven't met a black person that doesn't work for him. Of course, it turns out Chris's girlfriend is part of a weird brain transplanting cult and that Chris needs to kill each member of the household to finally get out. In the end, Chris's friend Rod surmises the entire film in one offhand joke. I mean, I told you not to go in that house. Get Out and The Purge mark a shift in how Blumhouse films present the home. Whereas early Blumhouse films focused on how seemingly idealistic homes and neighborhoods are no longer safe, corrupted by unseen monsters, these later films present the home as symbiotic with the monster. It's not that the Armitage family has corrupted an otherwise nice suburb, their evil is one and the same. In Jordan Peele's follow-up Us, the Wilsons, an upwardly mobile black family, take a trip to their summer home in an upper-class beach side community. And yet again, something doesn't feel right. But this time, it isn't that everyone else is out to get them. It's themselves they have to worry about. I can't be here. I... It's too much. It feels like there's this um, black cloud. Just... It's not too soon thereafter that the family is attacked by their doppelgangers, resentful of their other half's posh lifestyle. When the girl ate, her food was given. 
given to her war. The message behind us boils down to what does the dream of upward mobility of suburban bliss actually mean for everyone else? Who gets to live in a house and conversely, who doesn't? The literal real estate occupied by the Wilson family and others means a cast of people who are relegated to living below ground outside of that dream. The basic question of the film posits, are there casualties in our quest for the American dream? The idea that homes can twist us beyond recognition, like Adelaide forgetting she actually came from the underground, is a recurrent theme in later Blumhouse films. In Get Out, if Chris stays with the Armitages in their home, he will forever live in the sunken place. And in Blumhouse's The Invisible Man, Cecilia confides that she had to escape her home because she didn't feel like herself there. Under her abusive husband's thumb, she was becoming a different version of herself. He controlled how I looked and what I wore and what I ate. Similarly, in Blumhouse's Halloween sequel, Lori's daughter comments that she had to get away from her mother and their house, lest she end up just like her. I've spent my entire life trying to get over the paranoia and neuroses that she has projected on me. Later, when Lori kills Michael Myers, she does so not by expunging the boogeyman from the home, but by trapping him inside. The home now becomes a literal prison. Just this year, Blumhouse released their latest film, You Should Have Left, which not so coincidentally is about a family trapped in a house which refuses to let them leave. Somehow, Blumhouse has yet again tapped into the zeitgeist. In a time when people are stuck self-isolating in their homes, this new film reflects these same fears. From the company's inception, Blumhouse has presciently reflected the current climate, often spookily predicting what's to come. Blessed be our new founding fathers and America, a nation reborn. From the economic crisis of the early aughts to today's quarantine blues. How has Blumhouse been so consistently on point? Is it just a result of their cheapo business model, or have they made some Faustian deal with the devil themselves? It has been said that if a human makes a bargain with a demon for wealth, power, or any other benefit, they must forfeit their firstborn male. Regardless, the result is the same. Blumhouse has captured the American home like no other, twisting the place which we spend the most time into our undoing. So, Wisecrack, what do you think? Has Blumhouse made you afraid of your house, or do you foolishly still sleep soundly at night? Let us know in the comments below. Huge thanks to our patrons for all your support. Purge that subscribe button of all its demons, and as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.